Good morning. Welcome to our session on the impact of the midterm elections on federal health care policy and health care in California. Um, according to Pew, 75% of voters um, cited health care as a very important reason um, for them to vote in the midterms. <clears throat> Is this better? Okay. So if you didn't hear it, the Pew said that 75% of voters uh, indicated that health care was a major issue for them in their decision to vote. Um, today we're going to flip the question around and ask how did their vote affect health care or how will it affect health care. Um, to lead us in this discussion, we have uh, Cindy Enos to moderate. Um, probably many of you have come to our forecast conference uh, know Cindy, um, but she is uh, an attorney licensed in California and Colorado. She is currently the executive vice president of Hope um, uh, Healthcare, sorry, Cope Health Solutions, a healthcare consulting firm. And she was for seven years the director of the Department of Managed Healthcare Services, overseeing health insurance for 21 million uh, Californians. She has a long and distinguished um, career, and you can uh, see the full details in your packet. Um, I just was wanted to give you a couple of highlights. So I'm going to turn it over to her to um, lead us in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, the first thing I wanted to do before we start is to just take a second to acknowledge you know, what's going on around us, um, what the governor describes as the new abnormal. In I'm, Sacramento, where I'm from, obviously, we're fighting a, a huge fire with much loss of life down here. Uh, the Wolsey Fire, the Hill Fire are uh, ravaging the, the countryside, and then uh, the gunman shooting. I mean, there's just a lot going on. And, and I just want to make sure that, you know, I know we're all carrying that in our hearts, and I just wanted to make sure that collectively we're sending our hearts out to those who are fighting fires, those who are have lost things in the fire, those pets that have been lost, um, and the lives that have been lost. And just take that, that second to do that. And then come back to this notion, I think, of the new abnormal. Uh, as that Chinese curse goes, may you live in interesting times. We certainly have interesting times. And uh, again, the governor's description of the new abnormal in terms of our environmental issues might actually describe some of our political situation as well. Uh, with an administration that thrives on controversy and a state that thrives on combating the uh, Trump administration. And that is the construct, the paradigm of what we might describe as the new abnormal. And I have to note one, um, one remark from a Trump House, uh, White House staffer who said that working at the White House is like an episode of Jerry Springer minus the paternity test. And, sorry, Ed. Um, so our job today is to, I guess, uh, give you some hindsight, give you some insights, and give you some foresight as to what is happening in the arena of health care, both uh, statewide and national. And as we thought about it and talked about it, it's so easy nowadays to see things as so separate. And you know, there's just so much coming at us all the time that it's very, very hard to kind of parse it into what we need to be seeing in healthcare. And what we need to be seeing in healthcare is leadership and we need to be seeing innovation. And so those are themes that we are going to return to as part of our discussion. And um, I want to introduce my two other panelists who are people that I have had the incredible privilege of working with for many, many years, and uh, the, the honor 
of serving with them uh, in, in the administration, in the, in the Schwarzenegger administration. To my left is Bill Barcelona, and Bill is Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for what was formerly CAPG, now APG, or APG? What, Whatever okay. works. America's Physicians Groups, because you know, having conquered California, they needed to take on the world, right? <laughs> and um, and bring you know that that notion of coordinated care to the rest of the country. And uh, Bill, in addition to being a wonderful friend of mine, is uh, somebody who has tremendous insights. He served. Well, I met Bill when he was my deputy director for plan and provider relations, and then he left to go to CAPG. The rest of his bio is in your materials, but uh, I really look forward to his reflections. And then to his left is Ed Heidig, and Ed is the regional director for Region 9 for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Ed has been in his position for six months now, and, um, and I think the thing that he's discovered is that nobody told him about the geography of his territory. And so it, it apparently is like 6,000 miles wide, right? And you might describe that a little when you, when you get into your remarks. Uh, but Ed served as my chief deputy at the Department of Managed Health Care and is one of those people I admire who are thoughtful and who think before they speak, neither qualities of which I possess. So those are kind of a valuable balance there. So uh, with that, I think let's go ahead and, and, oh, actually, you know what I wanted to do? Since some, I thought about asking them this question, and I thought instead I'm going to ask the audience. Generally, I will ask my panelists, what's keeping you up at night? But I'd actually rather ask you, what's keeping you up at night? What, what would you like to hear about, know more about from this session so that we are tailoring our remarks to make sure that, that we're getting that? Does anybody have any? I know it's still early, so I, I, I excuse anyone who feels reluctant to speak, but if somebody has something where you kind of think, you know, this is a burning question for me, so that we make sure we hit it. <laughs> okay, let's fold the tents, kids. Yeah. Yeah. Not that's, in our lifetime. <laughs> that's about it. But, you know, again, uh, pulling back to that question of where's the leadership coming from? Where's the innovation? What are the innovative ideas? Yes. Hi there. Um, Kathy Eiler from UCI, uh, Director of Government uh, Relations Federal. Um, wondering what your thoughts are on uh, the lame duck. Uh, do you, do you okay. think that there are any issues that are going to be moving forward in this very short period of time? Or do you think it's going to be pushed out um, uh, for the new Congress? Okay, well, we'll, all right, yes. One of the very important goals is to bring all of our people into health care. Even, even the poor homeless people who are working to get them homes and so on, but we have to bring our entire population into systematic health care. Okay, anything else? Richard. Yes, Richard. Yeah. Uh, Richard Chambers. Uh, Sydney, I'm sure you all are going to address it, but uh, I was listening on the way in this morning um, in, in Washington this morning as they started the organization of, you know, for leadership uh, in both the Senate and the House. Uh, curious what the panelists think about how this new Congress for the next couple of years can work together to address the critical issues, you know, marketplace stability, uh, long-term Medicare trust fund, um, uh, prescription, prescription drugs. So I'd be curious to hear what your okay. prospects are. Bill, uh, able to I'll, I'll have Bill take that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, uh, what, what you feel uh, will be the ruling uh, by the courts regarding the challenge to the ACA okay. and yes. the path forward to the Supreme Court okay. regarding that. Okay, very good. Anything else that's burning? This yes. I don't know if it's burning, it's kind of perennial, but what is single payer? 
<laughs> All right, Bill, another one of yours. <laughs> Bill's going to be talking a lot. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. All right, anything else? All right. The healthcare business models that were fitted were in deep cooperation. That's a little esoteric, but uh, we'll try and tackle. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll try and hit as many of those as uh, we can uh, while covering kind of the basis. Uh, so you can see the screen. So again, here's what we had anticipated talking about as amended by the audience. And, um, you know, again, just focusing on federal election re results, getting an intro and update from Ed on HHS and CM CMS agency actions, talking about, you know, the governor-elect and those health priorities and uh, with a supermajority, Democratic California legislature, and then the, the legal issues. So just in terms of introducing the you know national election implications there's still this sense that we're getting a rolling blue wave but it's countered by the notion that we had a revenge of the 46 percent you know the the 46 percent trump supporters that uh came in in droves and voted rock solid in that. So you've got that that uh, tension between those two notions and characterizations around that. Affordable Care Act, you know, we know, I, I remember saying to myself about six months ago, where the heck is the Affordable Care Act? I mean, is it still working? And so trying to understand, you know, really where are we in terms of the Affordable Care Act Litigation that Texas v. Azar case, which challenged the notion of, in, of having pre-existing pre -existing condition guarantees when the individual mandate had been lowered to zero and, and essentially uh, attempted to be nullified. Columbus versus Trump, which is a Medicaid case, and then um, closer to home, the Sutter, Sutter case around uh, consolidation. And then the Newsom Health Policy, this is the words that he's used, guaranteed health care for all, Marshall Plan for affordable housing, Master Plan aging with dignity. I'm interested in that myself. Middle class workforce strategy, cradle to college promise for the next generation, all hands approach to ending child poverty. And one of the things we just note there is that those are very social-oriented programs versus some of the emphases of the last of, of uh, the current governor, excuse me, Governor Brown, uh, around tunnels and some big builds uh, to do the roads and to do the bullet train. And uh, yeah. Okay, so just in California, you know, in, in California, we regard ourselves as unique. And in some ways, we are. And I think one of the things we can talk about is the fact that our uniqueness sometimes helps us and sometimes hurts us. And I think calling out some of those distinctions between helping and hurting uh, is going to be important as we talk about uh, particularly with Ed's uh, remarks around, around um, other ideas of how to approach the same problems. And uh, so, you know, we believe in high quality care, the coordinated care model. These are all things that are very foundational to us. We believe also that we are a hub of innovation. And I think that's one thing that increasingly across the country, I think, uh, there's some challenge to that that, that is, I, I think, very real. So with that, um, our, our remarks are going to be relatively conversational. We'll interrupt each other, hit each other with uh, the microphone, that kind of thing. So uh, just bear with that. And I'm going to turn it over to Bill. OK. So starting it off on a positive note, which is not usually what I do, um, 
this was this election was in a sense good news for democracy if you count participation by the electorate as an important metric i do and uh you know you go through so many elections in your life and you talk to your friends and you know people on the bus and everything and you say what you, you know what what did you do last tuesday and they're like oh i i installed a bird feeder you know and but not this year this year it was like i voted you know and it was like did you vote and uh and they uh, everybody was fired up on both sides for this election, and I love that. Um, uh, things can get a little bit hostile out there, but uh, everybody is engaged. Did the young and, people vote? Yeah, everybody <laughs> voted. I mean, it was, it was uh, my, my daughters were, and their friends were completely fired up. They were working and walking, and, and uh, everybody feels that they're, future is at stake. And uh, I don't recall that sense among the electorate in the last 40 years, really. Um, I think this is a very extraordinary time that we live in. So um, let's start with that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it's great to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> And you are a lovely and I, audience. And I want to, I want to disclose. I'm no longer practicing law, so uh, just you know, full disclosure. I'm not Esquire anymore. I'm in the active status. All right. So, before I forget. All right. Um, these figures are a little bit out of date. They keep moving every day, but um, we all know um, that uh, the Democrats have retaken the House. There are still a few. Um, a few open seats that have to be decided, um, but Democrats are firmly in control of the House and leadership will change. Just looking at a few of the changes here, I wanted to uh, just talk about a few things. It's um, in the House, the Energy um, and Commerce Healthcare Subcommittee, which is so important to how we regulate Medicare, um, will likely go to Frank Pallone, and the healthcare subcommittee will go to Anna Eshoo from Northern California. And, um, uh, you know, it's my personal hope that we'll see uh, an anteater alum, uh, my congressman, Ami Berra, Dr. Ami Berra, uh, finally take a seat on the Energy uh, and Commerce Subcommittee for Health in the next few years. Um, he's still a fairly young congressman, but uh, it'd be nice to have a doc from California helping out on national health policy. Um, in the Senate, we've got uh, changes. Chuck Grassley likely moved to finance chair um, in Senate finance. And uh, Mike Crapo um, be uh, taking finance, uh, assuming that the Republicans hold on to the Senate, and I think they will. So um, we lost a few advocates for things like Medicare Advantage in this election. Uh, Dean Heller from Nevada was a, was a Medicare Advantage champion. And, um, and so we have a little bit of a vacuum there in terms of advocates for uh, some programs. So, and then Senate, um, you can see that we're still on a razor thin edge here. Um, And then California, um, this is how it, it fell out. Uh, there's just a few assembly races that need to be determined, but on the Democratic side, these are all the offices that the Democrats hold now in Sacramento, uh, super majorities in the state house, all of the Congress, all of the uh, constitutional offices, and the Republican caucus is down to 12 senators and probably when the dust settles, less than 25 in the assembly. Um, so do you want to talk about the health insurance enrollment slide? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Essentially, this was just intended to give you a quick picture of uh, what California looks like in terms of uh, coverage. We've stayed very consistent and actually grown uh, in terms of, of coverage in some areas. Uh, individual coverage is, is slightly down. Um, and that individual coverage tends to dominated by uh, Covered California, which will be the next slide. Large group has stayed consistent. 
and small group has gained a little bit, uh, nothing, uh, I mean, you know, it's important to the people who've gotten coverage. Medicare managed care has grown a little bit. That's predominantly the Medicare Advantage mm -hmm. product. And then uh, obviously Medi-Cal, uh, the Medi-Cal expansion has greatly expanded the numbers of, uh, of beneficiaries on Medi-Cal. And then the ASO has stayed relatively the same, which is, you know, it's interesting to see your market stay uh, relatively stable like that. I need to. Mm -hmm. So those, those figures are mixed, and, and that's a problem. It's, it's difficult to determine precisely um, the shift out of fully insured large group into self-funded. Um, some of the figures that I've seen and worked with over the past year in Sacramento, self-funded has grown in the last decade from about 2 million lives to 8.1 million lives. And, um, and the area that we all regulated at Department of Managed Healthcare, which is fully insured, Knox Keen HMO, has has increased in the aggregate, but um, has decreased in terms of total HMO enrollment. So non-Kaiser HMO enrollment is down to 2.9 million lives. And, uh, and that's an area of concern that I want to talk about later. Yeah. We, I think that concern, I know Cindy and I yeah. greatly. Yeah. yeah, we, in many ways, my entire term in the chair as director was focused on this issue of the declining HMO enrollment, primarily because at the time in California that HMO product was the repository of, of good, uh, good benefits, good coverage. So uh, it's something that's concerned us. But, but that question, I should have had a slide that teased out that, that separation between how the lives have moved more to self-insured and away from uh, the commercially insured. I didn't, I didn't find a slide like that. So the, this question of, of Covered California, I mean, the success story of Covered California is, I think, something very real. And if you guys want to debate that, that uh, but I regard the establishment and administration and policies of Covered California as a great example of how you can actually really get things done and do something that has the requisite qualities that I always try to call out, which is, is it replicable, is it scalable, and is it sustainable? And if I apply those parameters to Covered California, I really have to commend the leadership of Peter Lee, but also the leadership of uh, during the Schwarzenegger administration when we got the ACA landed on our desks that said, now go implement. The thoughtfulness of how to approach the benefit design um, in our traditional liberal fashion, while at the same time um, trying to bring uh, Peter's sensibility from uh, from PG, not PG. <laughs> I've been saying PGE, PGE, uh, PBGH, in terms of how do you marry those? I think has been a, a strong success story, and uh, a good model for for uh, the nation in some ways. But what Peter did in order to maintain the uh, premiums, at which right this year are uh, going up um, an increase of 8.7%, so approximately 9%. And what he says is that the, the, the primary factor in that load of uh, premium is, in fact, the uncertainty built into the question around whether uh, health plans can recoup their, their, their cost-sharing payments. And that he regards that, and his folks regard that as about a 90 percent, excuse me, a 9 percent load factor, risk factor. And um, you know that's regretful because uh, it, it obviously starts pricing healthcare out of out of the affordability for people who are non-subsidized. In the exchange, however, in, in Cover California, approximately 80 percent of people are in the subsidized coverage. So it, in many ways, describes a market for people who 
are not Medicaid, but who obviously can't really afford to maintain coverage over a period of time, and has answered a problem. It has alleviated a major, major flaw in the American system, which is uh, essentially saying we're going to have a, a private market system that's heavily regulated. That left a lot of people out of coverage. Covered California is, I think, a good example of how uh, they have, in many ways, alleviated that problem. But what Peter did, his team did, was load much of the extra costs of uh, the risk into the subsidized coverage. So in essence, the federal government is having to pay for the increases, the premium increase. That's correct, isn't it, Ed? No? OK. I agree. Sorry. Yeah, no. yeah. OK. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. Any question here? If, if in the open market, we had pre-existing conditions that no longer were going to be underwritten, which California, which covered California gave. So if that happened in the open market, and in the open market there was the availability for insurance companies to be subsidized by the government, which Cover California has, do you think there would have been a need for Cover California? Yeah. That's a good question. Well, I mean, again, you could look uh, one of the problems of our very decentralized health system is the lack of centralization uh, and you know the inability to really kind of create that place. So uh, one of the central concepts of the Affordable Care Act was this notion of a marketplace where um, everybody was shopping in the same in the same store. And I, I actually do think that's really important because in insurance, you know, one of the things that is a problem is that your lowest common denominator player often wins, at least in the short term, you know. It, and so that when I was regulating, what plans would say to me frequently is, look, I don't mind your telling us to do ABC. But it has to apply to everyone equally, because you have to level that playing field. And so that's the thing about Covered California and exchanges generally, is that they create that marketplace, and they create a set of rules uh, that everyone has to operate on. And, and again, you see that in other industries. Banking isn't, well, maybe banking is kind of Wild West sometimes. but. Uh, in general, we would never regard banking as, uh, as appropriate to be so decentralized that everybody gets to make up their rules. So first concept of ACA is create a marketplace where everybody has to shop with the same basket, essentially. So I'll just add to that. Um, you know, it's been a $200 million investment to create Covered California. And, and there is that other notion that perhaps we could have subsidized the small group market through other mechanisms. The small group market has shrunken in California to 1.8 million lives, which is shocking to me. When, we were at, when I was at DMHC in the early 2000s, small group market was, I think, almost four or five million people. It was very robust. Mm -hmm. And you know, after years and years and years of 20% premium increases, it died. And um, the interesting thing about the individual market is that when I was running the licensing division at DMHC in 2003, the individual market had a million one people in, in the enrollment. So this is pre-ACA. And today, the, the covered California market has about, they say about a million four, but with the churning in and out, it's really still about a million lives. and yet. What if we added another 10 million people to the California population in that interim time period? So the market has stayed relatively small. Um, and Covered California wields a pretty big regulatory stick on the market um, for, its si for the size of enrollment. Um, and I still wonder about the uh, long-term 
whether that investment that we've made in covered California will pay off or not? I think that's a great question. You know, and again, it does come back to this notion of how do you create the um, appropriate circumstances and structure for innovation to occur and for the good things we want to happen to occur. And I, I think that's a really uh, reasonable question to ask, is at the end of the day, if we've created a very expensive structure, um, and you know, again, with the notion of, of creating that marketplace, has it truly addressed the problem? I argued that it has, but I mean, I Bill's mean, pointing out some. Yeah, I mean, you know, on the flip side, um, it did. It created a market basket that's recognizable to consumers, and we didn't have that in healthcare. Yeah. We have over 10,000 benefit designs on the market in California, and what Covered California came in and did was simplify that dramatically and make it easier for consumers to figure out mm -hmm. what they're getting. And that is really, I think, a driver for consumerism in healthcare. Mm -hmm. which has been, was predicted in 1994 by um, Reggie Hertzlinger, and, and I'm still waiting to see that wave. Which one? The, the, the oh, the consumerism wave in healthcare, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. We still don't have the mechanisms in place. I think Covered California brings some of that. Um, some fairness. Some foundational Some fairness there. to yeah. consumerism. Yeah. yeah, that's a concern. Yeah. Um, do you want to do that, that's, the update? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I'd like to like to give Ed a chance to oh. talk here if he wants to. <laughs> when, I, when I see an opening, I'll, I will not be shy. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Um, so status up back, update on the ACA impacts. Um, this is really your slide, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, you know, again, uh, the, uh, we work a lot with hospitals and health systems. And I would say, by and large, they're worried, but they don't know quite all the things they're worried about. You know, the 340B issues are, are certainly resonating with, with uh, some of those. But while they have, you know, again, faced the sizable Medicare payment cuts and their uncompensated care has gone down, uh, the notion of expansion and, and, and the very dominant expansion in California has also alleviated uh, that suffering. At the end of the day, however, the, while the publicly traded hospitals and the big not-for-profit hospitals have fared well, I think we are starting to see some of that shakeout that I remember Dwayne Donner, the very prescient Dwayne Donner, uh, former head of the California Hospital Association, uh, at least eight, 10 years ago said, publicly that some some shall die, you know, that some of these hospitals are going to die. But as I said to him at the time, I said, how? I mean, how does a hospital get taken out of a community? And that's that actually is a very hard political process. And yet at the same time, I think that we are seeing, uh, starting to see those impacts uh, both in California and across the country. Admissions have stagnated, I think that's fair to say. Part of that is just trends in keeping people out of the hospital, that notion of trying to keep them healthier. And, uh, but in, in any event, keeping them out of the hospital. I was talking to a Kaiser doc the other day, and she was saying that for a hip replacement, it used to be at least a two-day stay in the hospital. It is now outpatient. And that just reflects the kinds of trends going on. And um, for Kaiser, that makes a lot of sense in their model, in their payment model. For every other hospital, uh, that loss of a, a, an admission day is, has real consequences. I serve on the board of a safety net hospital in East LA. And every time they report the numbers, they have um, a managed care strategy that is being implemented. And so every month or every quarter when they report their numbers, I ask them when, when the numbers, when the admits have gone down, I said, are we happy that the admissions have gone down or are we unhappy? Because that's strategy right there. You're either 
happy that they've gone down because you have a robust managed care system that is, in fact, embracing that population in a new way and realizing revenue in potentially other forms and, and uh, places, or you're unhappy because you are completely still reliant on that, uh, that other model. And um, even if you've got your toe in the water, as we talk about, you know, one foot on the shore, one in the boat, um, that, that you're dominantly planted on the shore of fee-for-service. And I would say that, that notion of trying to figure out that major change in business model spurred on by the Affordable Care Act, but by, cer by certainly not just an ACA kind of an impact, is one of the just major conundrums that, that uh, certainly many of the hospitals that, that we work with, health systems and uh, hospitals, are, are trying to deal with. We, we were definitely in a phase in California um, well before the Affordable Care Act of hospital consolidation across the state. Um, you, don't, you see it here in Southern California, but there's still so much competition that it's not, it's not overwhelmingly so. But in the North, it is really um, evident, especially to policymakers, to the legislators, to the attorney general. Um, and everybody's focused on the impacts of financial consolidation now. We're just in that phase of the ACA implementation here in this state where we've done the coverage expansion. I know we're still talking about how to cover the remaining three million, and we will talk about single payer versus universal coverage. But really, the focus is going to shift dramatically in the next legislative session um, to the impacts of financial consolidation among providers. And we had two big bills in the legislature last year, SB 538 um, by Bill Monning and AB 3087 by Ash Kara on uh, remedies f against provider consolidation. And the reason why these bills are coming forward now is because of the growth of the self-funded sector of the market. When you've got 8 million people in self-funded employer plans and the plans themselves have no way to manage cost effectively because those are, they're fragmented coverage designs. They lease networks. They don't have um, a good leverage over integrated care like we had in the fully insured HMO market. You don't have the delegated model groups. Uh, you don't have mechanisms to control um, spending on drugs. Um, the employers are fed up. They're just fed up with consolidation and they want to exact revenge in, in the legislature. Yes. So what do you think is gonna be the impact for employers with the talent shortage in the market? and you know recruiting talent and these employees saying this is the benefit design i want mm -hmm. i don't want this you know manage my costs i want benefits yeah and i think employers still really struggle with what they want um i've been working with employers a lot lately on policy and they you know, they, they want to move into the ACO market. They want some level of organization, but I think their conception of ACO is that you have the broadest possible network, but you have all the benefits of utilization management and coordination of care and risk, risk shifting to providers. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty difficult nut to crack, right? I mean, that's been the bane of ACO development is yeah. that it's all things to all people. And it's so nebulous, and you really can't build those controls without closed networks and high investment in integration. And I think what um, you know, Cindy's slide here on status update is, is that you know the ACA spurred an even greater move toward consolidation. And while we were consolidating hospital systems in California well before the ACA, really when the next shoe dropped, it was all about acquiring physician practices into those hospital systems. And now we have 40% of the doctors in California working in foundation models effectively owned by hospitals. And um, employers have taken note of this. You see it, I don't know if any of you were down at RAND about a month ago when Health Affairs came to California to preview the uh, September California issue, but 
all of the presentations were on the impacts on the market on, of financial consolidation among providers. It's really the hot focus right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be moving into this next session of the legislature with a new governor trying to get to universal coverage in some form. And at the same time, there's going to be tremendous pressure on infrastructure in California of how we deliver care. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, pick your allies and your enemies, you know, when you're fighting like cats and dogs on one bill and you're joined at the hip on the other. And that comes to this issue of how do you get to good policy? And I, I yeah. think that, you know, uh, uh, I think that's one of the, the central concerns is just we, where is it out of all of that, that we're pulling the good ideas and expanding them. Ed, um, I was hoping you could talk about HHS and CMS activity and also bring into that what we were talking about around the disaster the planning. And uh, Bill, I hope you'll chime in on that at the state level. Okay, sure. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Jacobson and, and Margaret Wong for having us here at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I'm Ed Heidegg. I'm the regional director for HHS, US HHS. Uh, I work, I live in Sacramento and work in uh, San Francisco. So I get up every morning at four o'clock. So nothing keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> but uh, the secretary, uh, Secretary Alex Azar, uh, who I work for, and I'm in his office, although I'm uh, sited in, in uh, San Francisco. Region 9 is the four states of California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and uh, the Pacific Islands, the territories, and the affiliated states. So it is a massive area. I think from one end of the Pacific Islands uh, to the other is 3,000 miles. It's another 3,000 miles to Hawaii. And uh, so it's just large and eight time zones. Um, the Pacific Islands and territories are sparsely uh, settled or uh, populated. Um, and they have a lot of um, health care issues. Um, and, and right now, uh, the, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands w was devastated by a uh, hurricane of uh, terrific force which has basically uh, leveled great sections of that, of that commonwealth and, and has created uh, healthcare issues. We have been uh, proactive and have cited uh, US public health uh, doctors and nurses and all kinds of uh, folks and equipment ahead of time, and, and, but there's a uh, great need there. Um, the Secretary's four priorities to advance uh, health and well-being of all Americans uh, includes uh, drug pricing and transparency. I'm just going to read off of this. And, uh, and for that has been uh, trying to, you know, drug prices are too high and they should be brought down. And the marketplace doesn't work as it was designed to work. And so there's been a, a whole series of actions uh, with what we call the blueprint for uh, you know bringing down prescription drug prices, uh, and it's a cascade of initiatives. Uh, many of them are designed to build more cons uh, transparency for the consumer, uh, to uh, make the marketplace, uh, to police the marketplace, make it uh, more viable, um, and I think it's been uh, very successful. It has had some bipartisan. Uh, support. I, I think uh, the Secretary has just recently called for the uh, uh, to have uh, list prices required in TV advertisements for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, drugs. And uh, uh, Senator uh, Dick Durbin from Illinois uh, uh, wrote a very nice uh, letter of uh, letter to the editor in the Wall Street Journal recently which uh, supported that. Um, in addition to that, uh, the president has signed legislation which removes the gag order or gag requirement of PBMs to pharmacists uh, not to disclose uh, prices uh, to uh, consumers, customers, 
uh, on where they could buy their drugs uh, at a cheaper price. And, and that, uh, again, it passed uh, the Congress and was signed by the President. Um, but there's a number of issues like that that have um, uh, brought down drug prices, and I, I think they're going to continue to uh, bring down drug prices. Um, another, can I yeah, uh, sure. interrupt with a, a question here? Because to me, this is a great example of that question of um, where are the new ideas coming from and how will we innovate? Drug pricing is a great example where the giveaway in the Affordable Care Act of saying that uh, pharma didn't have to negotiate, you know, that, that the drug, deal, drug dealers, that's probably not a fair characterization, excuse me, uh, didn't have to negotiate, it essentially took the major bargaining chip off the table, and that was in a Democratic administration. That was done. And, and so now, you know, we're now in a very market-driven approach, which is to say we're going to empower consumers, we're just going to make sure information is out there. And um, at the end of the day, where do you see, and Bill, I'll ask you the question, where is the real innovation there? I mean, is it really reasonable to think that just listing prices solves it, or can, should we be looking like to Amazon to, to basically break up, break up the market? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I gave short shrift to it, but, you know, there's this cascade of initiatives in this blueprint to bring down uh, drug prices and put American patients first. So, you know, one of the issues is negotiation. Okay, uh, you know, Medicaid and Medicare don't really negotiate uh, reduced drug prices. So to put one, of, you know, one of these, you know, it's hard to describe cascade, uh, but, you know, one of the uh, initiatives that was taken, it was a building block of negotiation, is to uh, streamline uh, the approval of generics. And so in 2017, 2018, Dr. Scott Gottlieb uh, approved always paying attention to the gold standard of FDA, of effectiveness and safety. But he approved, uh, I think one month alone, uh, 126 different generics. So we have many generics that have been approved. Generics are 40% to 50% uh, cheaper than brand name drugs. And there's, say what? Generally. Generics are generally cheaper than brand name drugs. And you, when you have a vast uh, quantity of generics out there that have been approved, then the uh, CMS can start negotiating and bringing down that $12 billion price tag that is out there uh, to uh, a much, you know, and it gets savings. That's an innovation. There are other innovations that, that we're looking at that are not they're not ready for, uh, you, know, you know, to be uh, released. But, I mean, they would be uh, some uh, self-prescribed drugs that might be uh, for, you know, chronic uh, pain, which would be a cheaper way to go, um, and things like that. Do so. you see, Amazon, I'm just going to um, want to pursue this, because I think this is a good example of where potential disruption and innovation. And I, so I want to ask you both about the role of Amazon in on this issue. So in not just Amazon, but, you know, we've been looking at, uh, in Sacramento, the current director of DMHC has been reviewing a merger for several months between Aetna and CVS. And, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation. We get calls from Wall Street people all the time asking what's going on, what's in the director's mind. I don't know. What what will the state do about this merger? And and it's interesting, I was having dinner with a good friend of mine who's a, um, a CEO of a healthcare organization, and uh, I posed a question to him on election night, and he laughed and said, oh, Amazon's going to eat their lunch. Um, the retail pharmacies will be out of business in 10 years. Um, and then Amazon will take over this space fairly rapidly with convenience. And uh, But I don't know that Amazon will really cut prices or have leverage to do that. Okay. Um, 
It's so heavily regulated. Um, we need, I mean, in my opinion, I think we need, we do need federal government yeah. intervention in, in the marketing. You know, there's a few other things to talk about, though, because you mentioned innovation. You know, large hospital systems have got together and, um, and are building their own uh, infrastructure for development and manufacture of generic drugs. I mean, that's a new mm -hmm. innovative disruption. Um, people are desperate, and they're reinventing the wheel on a lot of these things. But I do agree with your comment on generics um, pricing. You know, in my world, with the delegated model groups in California, you know, the hallmark of the delegated groups was that they took risk for drugs for so many years and, um, and had 95% generic prescribing rates. And then um, when the cost of generics rose to within 10% of brands, that mechanism was really no longer that effective. And they've really scrambled to provide value in that market. And one of the things that we've done over the past three years is to try to engage with drug manufacturers to talk about ways where we could share risk for drug prices together between providers and manufacturers. But it is a really tough legal issue. Um, there are so many um, barriers legal to barriers to that. Um, that we're a long way off. And then lastly, I wanted to mention this group in Boston um, called ICER, I-C-E-R. Have any of you heard of this new group? I saw a presentation by them a month ago. Um, they're, um, they're a private American version of NICE from Britain. And they're starting to educate people about- So we're not NICE. About quality, quality metrics, you know, quality of life metrics per cost of the drug and putting out some very interesting information on that. Wow. Um, and they're just doing it, um, it's a private not-for-profit. Um, so that's starting, that's another force from consumerism. Yeah, let me let, uh, yeah, I wanna let Ed uh, finish his slide here. I kind of interrupted him. Uh, yeah. Is, is that, we know the VA can do that, negotiate with Medicare has not been able to do that because of the agreement, per se, with pharma. So is that an executive order, or is it an act of Congress? Or is it something similar to the administrator seeing this? By, you know. Um, we're pursuing to whatever the mechanism is, if it's, if it's something that can be done by uh, putting forth a regulation or or if it requires legislation, pursuing, but we've asked, you know, we're pursuing negotiating to bring down both of those prices. And I would just uh, point out that uh, EpiPen, they've developed a generic to EpiPen, and that has brought down the price of something that uh, is a matter of literally life and death for people. Uh, there's a number of other initiatives that uh, this, this self-selection uh, which is called an indication-based formulary design, would be uh, would allow for uh, again new innovation in market in market pricing. So there's a there's just a number of initiatives. I would uh, encourage you to go to um, our website uh, blueprint for bringing down prices, bring, uh, putting patients first. There's a lot of material there that uh, you can uh, chew on. So going back to your slide, Ed, sorry about that. But I know drug pricing is just a big deal. Yeah, well, uh, I think the Secretary's second initiative would be to, to uh, make for more innovation, putting value over um, volume. Uh, right now we pay for um, tests and procedures. We don't pay for uh, as much as we, we could or should in integrated care and, and for outcomes. Um, and that is uh, a major issue for the secretary. Uh, secondly, uh, making uh, health care more accessible and affordable. Uh, we have uh, the short-term uh, short uh, limited duration insurance plans and also association coverage as uh, policy initiatives, as well as uh, uh, putting, uh, allowing employers to put away money uh, for their employees uh, for healthcare purposes. Uh, these are um, initiatives 
on that. And then lastly, addressing the opioid epidemic, um, probably one of the most gripping um, days of my professional career was listening. Uh, we have nation to nation consultation. We have 153 different Indian tribes in Region 9. And for two days, I listened to uh, testimony from uh, Indian tribes in Region 9. And, um, you know, some of the Indian tribes in Arizona and Nevada, California, are really the front line of the opioid epidemic, which claims um, 48,000 lives in the United States. Um, and it's, uh, it's a terrible, uh, terrible issue. And uh, to see these uh, communities that um, are shredded uh, and uh, to try to shore that up. And uh, I think the, the Secretary has taken action uh, up and down uh, to uh, every life is precious, making uh, naloxone available to first first pro uh, first provider or first uh, uh, those that are in uh, meet uh, folks uh, first responders uh, to make sure that uh, there's uh, uh, literally billions of dollars out there for uh, treatment prevention uh, and aftercare. Uh, for those that are suffering. And we've found that medically assisted treatment is um, the way to go. It, it, it keeps folks, uh, it doesn't have this uh, reoccurrent problem of, of, uh, of addiction and relapse, um, and people can live uh, functioning lives, um, as well as research and uh, doing data sets that provides data on where uh, there are hot spots and in, in how to zero in and provide treatment. So these are, it's a comprehensive approach and we're starting to see that the corner is uh, turning slowly, uh, but it needs everybody's involvement. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we're working uh, with the state of California on this issue and as well as the other states in, in, region, in region nine. It's interesting to see the different models that they're putting forward um, and um, it, it, you know, we, we want to encourage that. It's, it is uh, uh, providing the dollars uh, and the support, and, and, you know, we're trying to get people to uh, the state governments to uh, communicate with each other, share best practices. So, good. Um, That's a good, the convener role is a good one. Let's, uh, let's well, uh, just the advance. The transfer of value over volume is, um, uh, is uh, Medicare planning to expand the ACO? Uh, models and engagement across the country? Well, um, you know, I'm not really aware of that, if that process is on or not. And if it is, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for me uh, to uh, acknowledge things that are for other people to uh, announce. But, uh, I do know that in the, uh, in CMS, we've, uh, gone after a, diff a number of different regulations that have that just stymie uh, effectiveness, and there's been uh, a twelve billion dollar savings just in restructuring how CMS does its its job. Um, we have a program called Reimagine HHS, which is looking at top to bottom how do we re structure how we do things so we can be more effective. And the last time that was done, I'm sorry to say, was 1973. So you can imagine uh, the kind of um, just uh, uh, issues and, and uh, bureaucracies that are in the way of trying to respond to these four initiatives that the Secretary has outlined. So we should uh, do those things. We should modernize. And uh, I guess postmodernize, you know, to to uh, catch up with the times. Yeah, I think it, from the provider side, I think it's interesting with the ACO market. Um, my association, APG, has been so involved in ACO development ever since the Affordable Care Act, and we were champions of that. And it's it's been a tough road. Um, and now, uh, you know, CMS has announced it's going to move off of upside only track one ACO to downside risk, and. Um, what I'm anticipating is that you're going to see a lot of hospital systems who've sponsored ACOs and Medicare under track one drop out. 
Um, you know, some people posit that maybe half of the ACOs will drop out of the program as we move to downside risk. The other factor, though, too, that would discourage it is uh, states are starting to jump into regulating downside risk ACOs, including our own. Uh, California is looking at a regulation that may may do that. We're not certain. Um, I don't know if that's going to have a uh, negative impact on people's willingness to participate in the program. Yes. So, so what do you think of, uh, of Secretary Azar's comment um, last Thursday regarding moving forward with mandatory bundles for cancer care and for other conditions? Um, whereas the BPCI Advanced Program is a voluntary program which just started October 1st, and then they just came out with this announcement which kind of reverses that decision that Price made to roll back on the uh, mandatory bundle in orthopedics in certain markets and to not move forward with the cardiovascular bundles. The, the pressure from the provider side is intense. There's so much um, pushback um, with the administration over transition to value-based payment. You see it reflected in these, contra these evolution, well, we'll say it's evolutionary, not contradictory, okay? Um, yeah, it's chaotic in a sense as we keep changing policies. And that yeah, and I think chaotic. that's one of the biggest factors that, that hits the provider community and, and in general, it's just that uncertainty. Uh, you can't base a five-year budget on, you know, on a one-year uh, strategy uh, out of Washington. I mean, you really do need to have some certainty. And I think, uh, in general, that's what I see in our clients reflect is just that you you just don't know which way the wind is going to blow. I mean, you've yeah. been in a you've been in an upside downside or an upside only uh, relationship, and then all of a sudden the next year you're supposed to move to managing downside risk. In California, that might make some sense because we've got some sophistication with risk. But in the other parts of the country, I mean, there's just nothing. No, nothing it's a it. national market, but, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's an evolutionary trend. I want to say I support what the secretary is doing. <laughs> uh, but, and, and, and I do, and he's a driver. And uh, I am. Um, I am. Uh, I thought I was a driver when I worked for Cindy Enos, who's a warrior. But uh, I, you know, I have downgraded my uh, evaluation myself to a three iron. Uh, and the secretary does. He's he's driving these things. He's driving, and he does want to go to uh, value based over. Uh, tests and procedures. I think he's going to get there, and I think we all benefit from that. California has advanced on these issues, uh, and I would I would turn to opioids. I mean, w we obviously use more opioids, say per capita, than Europe does, and we're trying to drive drive that down with uh, medical, um, you know, uh, protocols relative to prescribing. Uh, it doesn't, it, and we've. I think in Medicare, Medicaid, it's gone down 30, 40 percent, the, the kind of prescriptions on opioids. It doesn't mean that we're anywhere near where we're supposed to be, but there's the balancing test of other issues like cancer, end of life issues, where uh, you, know, you start uh, going down one level and there's another. And uh, I know that uh, Vanila Singh, who is uh, the medical director uh, for uh, the assistant secretary for um, uh, health policy, it, you know, is basically has a committee of 200 uh, docs working on on trying to develop all these different uh, aspects, and I think we're going to get there. Right. We we have fallen behind in my task here. Okay, so. Um we're engaged in this discussion now over a complete transition of the healthcare system in California to what some would call a single payer model. Um, and, uh, and that legislation stalled. It passed the state Senate rapidly. It died in the assembly. It was held by Speaker Rendon and, uh, and the chair of the assembly health committee, uh, Jim Wood. And uh, at, um, at great personal expense, there was just a lot of pressure put on them for holding that bill through. Um, but the bill was not well conceived. It was not. Uh, it was a you know 37-page bill, 
and one third of the text was devoted to organizing doctors into unions. Um, it didn't really provide a lot of guidance on how we would transition um, a system to a, a new uh, four hundred billion dollar model. Um, and so, the conversation has changed now to to what we call universal coverage, which means let's build on the ACA platform that we have and expand coverage models to the remaining three million uninsured. And of those three million, one and a half million are undocumented um, uninsured, and you can't get federal funding for that um, through the Affordable Care Act. And so you have to figure out financing mechanisms for that portion of the uninsured. And there are a lot of proposals being considered. Um, you can increase subsidies in the exchanges to pick up about 500,000 lives among the uninsured. You can bump uh, subsidization all the way up to 400% of the federal poverty level, for example. Um, you can uh, shift from a coverage model to a care model. And, uh, and this is similar to what San Francisco has done. Um, San Francisco system is built on a care model where um, taxes are collected and and care is made available. You don't, you're not buying, you know, you're not getting a coverage card, for example. The money is going directly into building care centers. I could see that being one of the uh, proposals that moves forward um, with this new legislature and this governor um, to build on the San Francisco model, for example, where you get um, financing for that, though, is, is the big question. Um, will we pass a ballot measure in two years that would provide for a payroll tax increase, for example, to finance this. Um, some folks at Cal have modeled this and feel that the expansion for three million lives would cost about $20 billion, which compared to a $400 billion price tag for a complete single payer overhaul is much more doable in a sense. Um, tighter budgets ahead. We've, we're looking at a recession sometime in Gavin Newsom's first four-year term. Uh, we don't know when it's going to come, but uh, it certainly is going to uh, uh, restrict what people want to do. Um, and you know, now we have this new supermajority in the legislature that is actually a veto-proof majority. Uh, so, you know, you have this tremendous alignment of Democrats, but it won't last, it won't be unified. There will be um, factions that will develop in the legislature and there'll be competing interests. And um, it's the governor's job in California to say no to the legislature. Uh, it always has been, regardless of whether the governor is a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and so the legislature has been relatively restrained in recent years on fiscal issues, but that's because they've had They've had a lack of a veto-proof supermajority. Um, they've had to work with one or two Republicans on budget issues. They don't have to do that anymore. And so we'll see um, in budget negotiations that will start this spring how the dynamic evolves between um, the Senate pro tem, the Speaker of the Assembly, and the Governor's office over these new spending priorities. And then we have new legislation on merger and consolidation activity. Uh, AB 595 becomes effective January 1. And uh, we have three mergers that are under review right now um, in Sacramento. And uh, um, they've slowed down. They may be pushed over to the beginning of the year when this new authority um, takes effect. And, uh, the, and we're seeing a lot of state governments around the country enacting laws like this that now in, increase statutory factors for review of merger um, transactions to see whether it results in uh, unnecessary consolidation, um, whether there are guarantees that be, can be given around lower premiums or lower cost. Um, and those sorts of things are gonna be extracted from merger participants in, in future transactions as we move forward. And then making Medi-Cal work better. Um, we have tremendous work to do in terms of reforming um, 
the 14 million life Medi-Cal system. One out of three Californians are getting their care through this model. And it's becoming an increasingly siloed model in the sense that it's, it's driven through local health plans. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of provider network. Um, it's, it's developing um, you know, increasingly uh, tougher regulations around the delivery of care. Um, and it's challenging everyone. And then it's you know, hinging on $10 billion of fluctuating federal payment. Um, which could have a huge impact on whether, whether it moves forward. Um, in, the, uh, in the next session, you know, this new supermajority in the legislature, um, what we've really seen is a legislature that wants to tinker around the edges for big health issues. And um, now that we have this supermajority, the question is, um, if you don't move into a recession in the next few years, will they move on bigger, costlier uh, social issues? They tackled housing last year in the session. They passed a number of bills around housing. Um, will they work on other social determinants issues now um, and put real money behind them? And will there be a budget to, uh, to deliver that? I am just going to touch real quickly, and then we're going to uh, open up for, for questions. Um, this Texas v. Azar case, you know, as I said, was a fundamental challenge to the heart of the um, Affordable Care Act. And of course, it was done through the Tax and Jobs Act that reduced the penalty uh, on the individual mandate for failing to maintain insurance to zero. It didn't eliminate it, it just set it at zero. And that's a very important distinction legally. Uh, because Texas uh, VAs are as a case that 20 states brought claiming that the individual mandate uh, was unconstitutional. And as a result, the entire foundation of the Affordable Care Act was, um, was undermined. And that distinction, as I said, was important because the future Congress could adjust the number upward. So even if it set at zero, it didn't nullify and take out the individual mandate from the Affordable Care Act. And uh, so that ruling is expected to drop any day. And that it it will be very fundamental because it will either reinforce the Affordable Care Act or, again, put a bullet into this notion of the pre-existing condition provisions and protections. At that point, Congress will, in fact, be posed with the question of, of do we want to protect people who have pre-existing conditions? Obviously with the politics of that having been very front and center in the election results, the question of how they'd respond to that um, is something that I, I think is, is very significant to see. I mean, can they really maintain their party lines and differences when it comes to that issue heading into an election cycle in two years? I don't know if you have anything to add that. Okay. okay. All right. The, uh, the, um, that uh, I wanted to just quickly go back to Stuart VAs are only to uh, cite the fact that what you're seeing uh, uh, in Stuart VAs are and some of these other challenges are attacks on the uh, administration, the Trump administration, the Secretary Azar, uh, in the, the notion of establishing work requirements and other conditions around receipt of Medicaid uh, benefits. And these are very interesting challenges to watch because of the fact that the, um, the secretary and steward Viazar was found to not have made findings, ad uh, administrative findings to support the ruling, meaning essentially following the Administrative Procedures Act in, um, in determining that work requirements and other conditions uh, were appropriate and didn't weigh in how many people would lose coverage, would they be able to find private coverage, and what would the overall impact 
be, given that the underpinning of the Medicaid expansion was to allow people to have access to affordable and sustainable coverage. So that tension is something that I would cite to you to, uh, to pay attention to. And uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Sutter. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to. I think everybody knows the issues of consolidation in Sutter, and uh, obviously the the fact that the inpatient procedure in the Calif in the Northern California market being twice essentially as much as the Southern Calif California market says a lot about the entire industry. It isn't just Sutter. It is dignity. It is the UC system, excuse me, uh, but um, but you know this notion of tying the hospitals together for bargaining purposes. You can't get one, access to one without creating contracts for all. That was not invented by Sutter. I argued with the UC system over that exact thing in 2005. So uh, Sutter uh, again is is. Um, I think the most blatant example of what consolidation has has been bringing, it, which is much higher costs. So I'm not going to spend more time on that. So the the final question is is really this question of can California's government spur the next phase in healthcare innovation, or will it come from the private sector? I would also extend that to the national government. I mean, can we do that? Or is it uh, essentially a role that the private sector has to play? And uh, Ed, I might ask you first about this lame duck question. What can get done, and, and you too, can, what can get done in a lame duck session, uh, Bill, that uh, might advance the cause of, of uh, innovation, affordability, and expansion? At the federal level? At the federal level. And then let's go to the state real quick. Nothing much. Nothing much. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Okay. I think there is some, yeah, there are some things that have to occur here in the lame duck session around preserving some payments, um, but not much. And, uh, you know, the debate is around Medicare for all single payer. Um, that's got to flesh itself out. Um, and, uh, you know, there's got to have to be a lot of education around what it all, what what Medicare for all means, what it could really cover. Um, I think we're looking at a two-year debate. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Ed, did you want to add? Well, I would say that the the secretary's initiatives on uh, short-term limited duration plans, association plans, actually, that's the Department of Labor uh, contribution, and also for the the health accounts. Uh, for, for employers, for their employees, are innovations that w that I don't know if they're going to be utilized by California, but they would address this issue of this of the short term or the small market, the small individual market. It would it lead to uh, more growth in that kind of area? Whether California will avail itself of it, uh, you know, I don't. That's not for me to say, but I think there are uh, there's initiatives that the secretary is taking. And in prescription drugs and in, in, uh, in this uh, kind of market innovation and also uh, in paying for value over treatment that I think are, are winners. You know, whether they will take hold by uh, the end of this calendar year, you know, I, I'm sure it's, it's more of an evolutionary process. Yes. Well, with one month to go, yeah. it's probably a But I mean, we're, really, we're really transitioning. We're transitioning from a governor who has been one of the most fiscally prudent curmudgeons of this century to a new untested progressive governor who wants to advance programs in several areas, mm -hmm. not just healthcare, but in all the social areas mm -hmm. as well. It's a really, um, it's, it's an ambitious agenda. And you have a legislature, you know, a third of the legislature is turned over here. We have some new people coming in. But they're generally fiscally prudent people who come from city councils for the most part. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how much of an appetite they have for change. And then we have this tremendously regulated healthcare market in California, mainly because of the expansion of Medi-Cal. You know, with one third of the market now being driven 
by Medi-Cal, that's a regulated model. Is there space for innovation in the private sector? Will self-funded employer plans continue to innovate in the ACO market? Will they be prohibited by state regulations that will keep them in a small box, um, just using old lease networks and fee-for-service payments? And then will Amazon and some of these other big players come in and try to disrupt the delivery side of the market um, through their models? That's really what we have to look forward to. I wanted to turn to the audience. Did you have some questions? I know some questions I kind of ran over um, there. Yes, please. So some of, this, some of the structural changes that have already taken place here in California and that we had to kind of state maybe, I think, do you see any room for um, well-designed vertically integrated uh, systems where, um, where the where payers, the delivery system, uh, are all connected, driven by quality metrics, efficiency <laughs> metrics? Yeah, I think. Did, did everyone hear the yeah. question? So vertically designed systems um, that are driven by transparent performance measurement and value-based payment models. And I think that's at the heart of the Aetna CVS and the Cigna mergers. Um, to some extent, it's even the, uh, the merger, the third merger between the healthcare partners restricted license and the Optum Care restricted license to build an even bigger competitive model against Kaiser. Um, Everybody's thinking in those terms, you know. But now we have this new law, AB 595, which gives the director of DMHC this tremendous oversight power to say no, which we haven't had before. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and will they put brakes on the this type of activity in California or not? And everybody is waiting to see. I mean, Cindy and I get two or three calls a week from the Wall Street folks. You know, just digging, asking right? what's going yeah. on. And so far, I realize that all I've done is give them misinformation. So I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. one thing I, I have to, to, one anecdote. The one thing that I had to tell these folks is, you know, who are all in New York, Wall Street, and, you know, kings of the world. And so I said to them, well, Whatever happens, it's likely that, that the California regulators are going to extract essentially some monies uh, for you know for for the benefit of California, and they were shocked. They said, "What do you mean? It's our money." You know, I mean, basically, it's it's not California's money. And and I said, "Oh, that is not the way we look at it yeah. at all." That's not what we would yeah. do. Yeah, and it's not you know. And again, I want to be clear. It, it, the monies that from the United Pacific Care merger, the Anthem and Blue Cross of California merger that I oversaw, uh, my theory on extracting money for the benefit of Californians is if you're coming into the marketplace to do business, you have a responsibility to build up the healthcare system that you're relying on. And so, but they were very, very shocked and dismayed to hear that, uh, that there might be some, some financial uh, extraction there. So, yes. So circling back, the very first thing I wrote down, I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, my name is Alicia Brown, the uh, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for Orange County Business Council. So we represent large businesses uh, in the region. And one of the things you said in the very beginning, you said 5% of voters cited healthcare as a reason to vote to do research. Mm -hmm. So moving into the new Congress, is this just going to be more infighting as the Democrats are going to be taking that seriously, the ones that have been elected in? They're going to be taking that role seriously. Do you still just see more fighting between the administration and the new House majority? Or do you actually see something coming forward or something positive coming forward out of uh, this, new, uh, this new reality? I would hope for a change, but I don't expect it. I don't. I think we have to determine who's going to lead the Democratic caucus in the House first and see where that goes. And uh, if, well, too, though, what, what did people want? You know, so healthcare was the biggest issue in the election. 
What did that mean? What did people want from healthcare? Did they want free healthcare? Is that what they want? Um, no. You know, because that's an unrealistic goal. I don't think so. I think the yeah. wages are not matching up. Right. 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 So, right. and I look at that personally, and I think what people want is jobs. Jobs that provide benefits. And yeah. that's what the Congress has to deliver on in the next two years. But, but I think that's going to be hard. But, but I think health care really is that point where if something happens, I think it could happen potentially there, especially if they have to save the pre-existing condition protections somehow. If, uh, I think that does create a sufficient potential loss uh, for Republicans and, uh, and point for the Democrats that they ran on to potentially create something. Uh, Richard, did you have a... Yeah, I was going to ask direct a question to Ed. Uh, the Medi-Cal program for the last eight years has been operating under the broad federal 1115 demonstration authority. And the original approval back in 2010 and the, the five-year extension in 2015 were under the previous federal administration, which was, was much friendlier to California. Uh, the current waiver runs out in 2020, and next year uh, the administration in the, the state will be negotiating with that. Any guidance on what California should be concerned about as to what kind of reception it will be? Because there was a lot of um, beneficial components of that waiver which uh, a different administration may not be so uh, agreeable to. So should we be worried about that? Well, I indicated that I was inactive in the bar, but I still have a degree in jurisprudence. And uh, my prudence tells me uh, that that's a CMS issue with the national administrator and the regional administrator weighing in on that. So um, Bill has I'm going to. a problem, however, weighing in. Yeah. So, Richard, um, this is really going to be fascinating, but a couple weeks ago, Mary Cantwell announced in a Medi-Cal advisory board call that the state is not going to seek a renewal of the waiver. So, Which has a lot of implications. So that's how you start the game of chicken with CMS, right? Yeah, but that's a pretty bold statement. Well, there's a lot to unpack yeah. there. I mean, the, the implications of not going for the waiver, uh, I think, are, are that write that down as the, maybe another yeah. topic to talk about. The if we don't go for a waiver, for the public hospital system, as you know, are huge, huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd like to go, not Barbara the Bash, I'd like to go back to that question about um, what can actually happen in the Congress um, with the change in, uh, in the House. Um, I don't, personally, I don't think it's just about, it's certainly about the blue wave, so to speak, is about uh, wanting uh, wages to keep up with, uh, with the economy. But it's also about getting accustomed now or used to the idea that maybe health healthcare could be available for everybody. And not just working people, but people um, who are not able to work or, um, and, and others. And so I, my question is what about the, what could change the direction of the Affordable Care Act from tearing it down bit by bit to adding to it or improving to it, improving it or maintaining it? And so what can the new Congress accomplish with the president still there and the Senate still there? And I'll let you answer that, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, let the I, you know, my observation in the last year has been that um, it's been the force of the Republican governors who have um, moderated um, the Republican caucus in the House. And I still think it's going to continue. It's going to be the force of the Republican governors trying to innovate in their states you know, we just saw this, what, three or four states expanded, they took the Medicaid expansion and we're gonna have three or four more other states follow suit. Um, and that means that the Affordable Care Act continues. Mm -hmm. It continues to develop. As more red states buy into the model, um, it becomes indispensable. Mm -hmm. And then Congress would follow eventually. Once the states innovate and, and make those decisions, 
then Congress will follow with refinements to the program. I think then we hopefully maybe get to an environment where we can have bipartisan decision making. But, you know, and I'll just, I'll say this personally, I think this administration is really focused on letting the states continue to innovate on Medicaid expansion on where they want to be. And I think we'll see a lot of innovation, different types of models, very different from California's approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I look forward to because I think actually California can learn from a lot of that that effort. I think that's a great comment because I, I think uh, I think looking at the Medi-Cal, Medicaid expansion states and how they are uh, approaching the, the benefits from uh, the California model, which is a, a, an open model to uh, a model that has work requirements. Joe Thompson from Arkansas ran through his model. Uh, that is, uh, you know, established around work requirements that has some negative impacts. Is that reasonable? All the way to the the model that was uh, over over ruled in Stuart V. Azar, which was a model where the individual had to go online, establish an account. Every month, they had to go back into that uh, account between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. and register, re-register their eligibility. And um, you know, those are the kinds of things we're testing now that I think are really worth watching. Because in California, we kind of take for granted that we're the innovators. But in this arena, uh, looking at issues around impact, affordability, of expanding Medicaid as kind of a more universal uh, safety net, I think we do have to have that laboratory of ideas. Now, I uh, do need to wrap up, and I want to thank my fellow panelists. Uh, as I said, I had the privilege of working with them both for many years, and uh, really just so appreciate your insights and your intellect. So thank you very much. <laughs>